factory and I'm going to shamelessly throw in some photos of uh, my local area as I go along just to uh, just to indicate how awesome it is to live in Australia. Uh, so this is just my local park. Um, so my name is Mark Nubbett as you can see and that's my Twitter handle down the bottom. So a little bit about me to start with. So uh, I've been around a while, I've known Mike for many years. Um, 10 plus years I suppose experience generally in integration, 20 odd years in, in IT generally. So I'm an integration messaging guy as well, a bit of a cloud person also. And I actually run the local um, cloud user group over here in Perth. I'm also for my thing a member of the Global Azure Bootcamp admin team with uh, Magnus and Martin and the others and Mike, the two Mikes. BizTalk developer, I've been playing around with the BizTalk actually since 2000, but probably doing it in anger uh, since 2004. Uh, also, Forefront's identity manager is one of my other little bits of uh, foray into, into development and, and design. I did the of course, and as I said down there, soon to be Australian citizen. So in uh, the January the 26th, I'll become actually fully Australian, hence the headband. So, just a very, very short agenda, just to start through the long. I'm um, going to go through a brief overview of what Azure Data Sanitary is. Um, then I'll dig into some of that detail a bit more. Um, we'll then talk about the data movement activities within uh, Azure Data Factory, followed by transformation, a bit about the development uh, cycle that you go through, um, and some monitoring information. I'm going to leave all the demos until the end. Um, that's just make sure you pay attention and, and there won't be questions at the end, what it might be. But uh, I should make sure that um, uh, I can get through the slide deck and get to the interesting stuff and do that all in one go. And then finally, just some general information, summary, and so on and so forth. So that's the view of Perth, uh, from a park just outside of Perth, just thought I'd mention that. Great little city if you want to come and visit. So, what is Azure Data Factory? Well, I like to think of it kind of like this cloud based integration, data integration. It's like ETL in the cloud. Uh, so, I think. SSIS, I suppose, in some regards, but, at, uh, but in the cloud. Um, it's about the orchestration and transformation of data and uh, really talking about large volumes of data here. It's, um, <coughs> it's designed to be very much a, uh, a, a big data uh, type solution. It's actually part of the Cortana uh, analytics suite in the information management space. And not surprisingly, it's on the platform, so it's, uh, it's, it's managed it's scalable and it's reliable. And you can see down there just a very brief graphic as to, uh, as to you know, the sort of thing that we're talking about here, ingestion, preparation, transformation, and publishing of data. What does it look like? Well, there you are. So it's, uh, it's got four key pieces, really. Um, I'm going to start with the bottom right, uh, bottom left, big one, um, which is the linked service. That's kind of the, uh, what, what a, what I personally think is the kind of the, the most important part, I suppose, in some regards. It's the bit that defines uh, any activities that are going on uh, or connections to activities. It defines connections to data. And then beyond that, you have the data sets themselves, um, activities consume and produce data. And then a pipeline, um, don't be confused pipeline in terms of uh, in terms of digital pipeline, although it's a, I suppose it's broadly similar. It's a bunch of things that get done in a specific order. So link services, like I say, for me, this is the kind of the, the basic unit. Um, link services can represent two things. They can represent a physical data store. So those can be one of a very, very large number of things. And I'll talk about some of those things in a, in a little while. But typically things like on-premises systems, cloud-based systems, <coughs> and more recently, the Azure Data Lake Store. That's just been added fairly, fairly recently. And then the, uh, the next thing that can be represented by link service the compute resource, so that's the that's the bit that does the heavy lifting, the, the actual transformation work. So, as you can see there, there's a, there's a few things: Hasty Insights, uh, SQL Database, Data Lake Analytics. I think for me, one of the interesting ones, which I won't actually do a demo of today, but uh, is the Azure Machine Learning Endpoint. Um, I'll talk briefly about that in a little while, but uh, that's that's quite an interesting one. So I'm just going to wander through with each one of these in turn, and then we'll uh, then we'll do some more interesting stuff a bit later on. So the data sets, what are they? They are basically named references to data just set up there. And you saw from that uh, from that the original graphic with a with the activity that they can be used for both inputs and outputs. They can be consumed and produced by those activities. 
um, within your within your data sets, you have to identify the structure that that data set has, and they can be um, internal or external to the uh, to the data factory. And we'll see an example of where that is the case. Not surprising, they can represent pretty much anything you like. And then there's these uh, there are system variables throughout the entire uh, data factory, which can be used. Um, in particular circumstances, the data sets, the two that are of particular importance are the slice start and the slice end. Um, the concept of a slice in, in data sets is uh, something which I'll dig into in a bit more detail a bit later on, probably when I'm doing the demo. But in essence, it's, it's, a, it's a capture in time of data based on the availability of that data. So that the slice start is when it sort of starts being available. And the slice end is when it starts being available. So activities are basically where things are done, and there's different types of activities. So you see just an example where it was, uh, it was just a copy. Uh, activity has one or zero or more inputs and one or more outputs. Um, if you're using something like, for instance, HD Insight, you can have multiple outputs. If you use something like copy, you can have one output. And it's the unit of orchestration of the pipeline. I'm going to shamelessly throw in this talk comments uh, here and there, uh, because why not? Uh, but so essentially, it's it's the think of it almost like a like a shape on on the BizTalk design surface. It's it's a it's a particular task within a pipeline. And there are activities for movement, transformation, and analysis of data. Um, the, the analysis can be uh, aggregations, anything like that, so HD Insight Hive queries, PIC queries, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, transformation, as the name suggests, is, uh, is just can very literally be um, changing or aggregating other information and transforming it in, in a specific way that's relevant to your output. Of course, the movement is pretty much copy. I think probably most of these things will look pretty familiar to anybody who's done SSIS in the past. There was a presentation on that last week. Um, so you know, none of this will be particularly uh, shocking to any of the ETL crowd. Likewise, with the uh, data set, there are a couple of pretty important um, system variables to do with activities, the window start and window end uh, system variables. And then again, because in much the same way you have data sets availability, you also have runtime for activities, and that window start and window end is essentially a tumbling window that runs across those um, across the, the availability of that uh, activity. And finally, the pipeline. Pipeline is really just a, a bunch of activities joined together. <clears throat> essentially, they are um, a unit of work. So again, this is, this is probably more akin to an actual orchestration within this talk, if you like. Or, or you know, a, a whole, a whole um, uh, integration in in SSIS. So the key thing there is you can also set the uh, active period of a pipeline in the past. And if you set an active period of the pipeline to be in the past, and the data is already there, it will just go ahead and grab all that data and run the pipeline and produce all the output based on the past. So that's all these great things like data migration and so on and so forth. Scheduling, well, as, as you can imagine, if you've got multiple input data sets and multiple things going on, then you need to be able to tell the system how and when these things are available. So data sets have an availability. Frequencies are things like uh, minute, day, hour, week, month, and so on and so forth. And you set the interval to be whatever you want it to be. Um, activities are scheduled, so that's that tumbling window that uh, that uh, says how often um, that uh, that uh, particular activity will run, and then a pipeline, which is a um, a collection of those activities, has an active period. And see down there that basically the active period is in that particular date format. If you don't set the endpoint, then it just takes whatever you've got at the start and adds 48 hours to it. And if you set the endpoint as lots and lots of nines, then essentially it's a, it just runs indefinitely. So the key point here is that this kind of introduces the idea around the fact that you may have data sets 
for instance, you might have a data set that's produced once a month, and you may have data sets that are produced every day, and you need to be able to associate those data sets together. So it's really about the dependency of those data sets, which leads me nicely into what I'm saying here. So you can imagine that if you've got a bunch of pipelines, you have more than one pipeline in a data factory, you need some way of linking those pipelines together. So that's what this data lineage is, is really around. So if you've got an input to one data factory and a couple of outputs from an input to one pipeline and a couple of outputs from that pipeline, you need to be able to tie those outputs to the next process. Well, actually, you don't need to tie them because data factory does that job for you. And we'll have a look when we do the, uh, the demo in a little while, but uh, actually, there's a really nice way of visualizing that in the portal. Uh, the point I already mentioned is that data sets can be either internal or external. Um, you have to mark a data set that is created externally, that's just for consumption by a pipeline. You have to mark that as external. That's one of the things you have to do. And you can set a policy around that as well in terms of how often it retries and retention and so on and so forth. So that's how lineage works. That's how you can tell how a thing strings together. We also have to know how these things are essentially dependent on each other. We use that by setting a start and an end time. Set the data set within the activity. And that uh, that creates, as I mentioned there, this dependency model. So again, going back to that example of if you have uh, a data set that's available for a month and another data set that's available for a year, you have to tell data factory that that data set that is available for a month needs to hang around for a month because you can't have it just used once, destroyed, and then are available for the rest of the time that uh, those daily data sets are being produced. Within your, uh, your um, data sets and, and, and activities, you can use a fairly rich set of functions. There's functions for text manipulation and, and date manipulation. And one of the classic examples of, uh, of using this is actually uh, when you want to create uh, a folder structure, you can create a folder structure based on start times of a slice, for instance. Uh, and you can use that to then be able to, to uh, store data or read in data. <coughs> uh, the big thing around some of this stuff is, again, this dependency stuff. We can't get away from the dependency. Um, when you set these things up and you set the start and end time of a, of a data slice, if you've got other inputs that are reliance on that, then you need to create some kind of function that, that represents the dependency period of the dependent data set, so the monthly data set, for instance, in the example I've got. In, in fact, that's what the uh, line down at the bottom, the add days, yeah, that's, that's a good example of that. So in that particular case, you might set a start time and an end time of a data set that needs to hang around for a, a week. Uh, you may use the date add days to do that. Oh, so there's my local beach. So data movement, this is probably one of the, um, probably the, the activity that you'll always use, I think. Um, it, even, even when you do other transformation analysis processes, you'll probably want to move that data off somewhere else once you're finished. Uh, you can see there that at the moment it supports quite a large number of inputs and a reasonable number of outputs. I think some, some interesting ones there is Data Lake Store, which has just uh, been recently added. You know, there's, there's also quite a few on-premises um, opportunities. The on-premises works through a data gateway, which we'll talk about in a second. But you can see that it supports Oracle, uh, MySQL, DB2, and so on. So pretty good for doing things like data migrations, um, or even, you know, should we say, moving from uh, one particular data provider to another. So how does it work? Well, data movement uses copy, act, copy activity, and depending on where you're doing it, where you're moving the data, it will either use the movement service or the management gateway. If you're doing on-premises work, or as your IaaS, you use the, the management gateway. Management gateway is just a little downloadable. Um, some guys, it's used in other places as well. Essentially, it just creates a service bus, really. Um, it's a downloadable piece of code. We'll have a look at it. So, downloadable piece of uh, 
executable. We'll have a look at it because uh, my sample uses that. But the way the data management service works, in sort of make data movement service works, is they've been they've recognised that obviously your data could be globally distributed. So what they've done um, is essentially run that data movement service up in all the data centres, with the notable exception being currently at least Australia. So no matter where you host your data factory, there's only a couple of data centers that currently allow you to host data factory. Wherever you host your data, if you're moving data, it will use the locally available data movement service. So that's all about efficiency, essentially. So it executes at the sync location. Um, if your sync or source is on-premises, it actually uses the data management gateway to, to move the data rather than the data movement service. The interesting thing about the Australia thing is if you have data that's in Australia as a source and data elsewhere, where you're storing the data is going to be elsewhere, then that's okay. If you have data elsewhere and you need to move it to Australia, then that's also okay. But if you have data in Australia that you want to move to Australia, it will actually fail. So that's, that's the current situation with the data movement service. They are going to roll it out to Australia fairly soon, thankfully. It's movement, so not surprisingly, it takes one input and, and produces one output because it's moving something from one place to another. And the data management gateway has certificate um, stores for, for, for making sure that the movement, if you want to go between on-premises and the cloud, is, is absolutely secure. I think this is that it does type conversions between the source and the sync data types. There is a, a list of the way that that works, actually within the documentation, I won't, I won't put on that here, but essentially it pretty much does type inference uh, and does uh, and does that between between the uh, source and the sync data type types. And the thing to uh, remember about the data gateways, the final point there really, is that data gateway lives on a machine. So whilst it can be used to um, move data, you can only have one instance of it on a single machine. But that's okay because actually you can use the data management gateway to move many data sources. So, so it can use move many data sources but only one instance on a single machine and actually only one instance within data factory, so individual data factory. Oh, that's another beach and a stick. So uh, this is just uh, just down the road, just another beach. Um, so we just talked about uh, data analysis and transformation. So I mentioned some of these briefly. Um, so essentially, this is about taking data and creating either different data from it or multiple data sets from it. You can see down on the right-hand side there, there are not that many compute environments, essentially, but um, not surprisingly, there's, uh, there's uh, HD insights for uh, all the Hadoop type stuff, uh, SQL store. SQL database and store procedures. Data analytics is, again, another one of the, the, the new pieces. Again, that's obviously quite a key part of the Cortana analytics suite. Uh, Azure batch at the bottom for, uh, for doing .NET. So if you've got to essentially roll your own transformation process, you can do by, uh, by using Azure batch. What I didn't mention was uh, machine learning. Again, I think this is quite, quite an interesting one. Machine learning, essentially, you can go in, you can create your own model, and expose it as a web service, and you can call that web service uh, from an activity. What they've added recently, because that was always uh, available, what they've added recently is this updates resource uh, process, which allows you to not only call your model from, uh, from, your, uh, from your data factory, but also to update your model. So if you've got data flowing through the system and you want to chuck a new data, uh, data training set at your machine learning algorithm, you can now do that and then call the batch execution process after it. So you can retrain your model whilst, whilst you're going along in flight. Two types. Um, there's an on-demand process, uh, bring your own. Um, currently, the on-demand only works for HD Insight. Um, there is talk about them doing it for things like Batch as well, uh, but, but right now it doesn't really work for HD Insight. Just some key uh, things that you need to set there. 
there is a time for this that you need to set, which essentially says, okay, well, once I've finished processing all my stuff, um, I'm going to hang around for this amount of time, and if I don't have to process anything else, then I'll destroy myself. So that's, that's why it's uh, on demand. You can choose whether you want to run it on Windows or Linux. Uh, Cluster size obviously just sets the number of nodes that you'll be running this uh, particular data analysis or transformation job across. Uh, but the one thing, and it's a key point really, uh, around the on-demand process is that HD Insight doesn't just skip into existence. It does take some time to provision. Uh, I've seen 15, even 20 minutes uh, for, for the time it takes to, to start up. So you constantly monitor your job thinking, still saying pending, still saying pending, and then everything springs into life. So just, just bear that in mind that it is, it is an on-demand service and it does have to actually provision an entire HD Insight environment before it starts running things. So they bring your own environments. Um, essentially, you register those as a link service, and there's some information there as to the, the typical um, required information that you need to provide to the link service. Oh, sorry, let me just mention, that's, my, uh, that's the view from my local drinking establishment. So development, not surprisingly, with uh, with with um, with a lot of these services nowadays, uh, JSON is lingua franca, and and anybody who's ever a play around with uh, with logic apps and so on will, will be more than familiar with that. So in the same way with data factory, everything is is, uh, is based on JSON, which is great, of course, because that means it's, uh, it's a nice easy way and storage and source control. So there's, a, there's really kind of a, a few ways of, of developing these things. The data factory editor within the, the portal, I actually quite like. Um, it's, it's, it's quite quite useful and, and gives a nice visual representation uh, and provides that whole data lineage process that we that I mentioned previously, and we'll talk about a bit more later. It allows you to create and deploy artifacts, and of course, you then have access to all the monitoring information uh, and, and drill down information that you're allowed to do. In the latest version of the uh, PowerShell, in the Azure Resource Management part of PowerShell, there is a bunch of commands for not only creating data factory, but also creating things like link services and data sets and so on and so forth. So that, that's another way of going. And again, that provides a great automation tool. And finally, the, the, uh, the Visual Studio templates, uh, they've been updated pretty recently. Um, we'll show you those in a, in a little while. Um, they're not without their issues, um, but you know, they are. And there's, of course, the uh, .NXDK because there's no always. So within Visual Studio, um, there's some great sample applications in the templates. Well, there's two. Um, one of which you can actually access via via the portal, which I'll show in just a little while. But beyond that, the, the basic templates are for doing or just creating a templated. Uh, analysis project using either Hive or Pig, and fairly typical uh, data copy type activities, typically between Azure services or typically between um, on-premises services. You can include some sample data if you so desire. Um, I'm going to talk about that uh, because it's not quite that simple. But, it, but essentially, you can uh, when you create, particularly the uh, <clears throat> the two sample applications, you can create a bunch of sample data and that just gets provisioned into the data factory and essentially you're good to go and it's a good good environment to start having a bit of a play around in. You can also, not surprisingly, during that process, create the data factory itself and all the bits and pieces that are required to, to execute that data factory. And the last part here, you can, you can publish to the data factory. Again, anybody who's ever used Visual Studio for any of the Azure tooling, a lot of this will be familiar. Um, I did recently have uh, have the opportunity to talk to one of the guys who's on the team over in uh, Microsoft Ignite over on the Gold Coast here in Australia, and he promised me that there was more stuff coming, so uh, probably in the next three to six months. The key point being that that last point on the, on the slide there is that at the moment, there's really not much in the way of tooling around being able to create activities and drop, dropping them on a design surface and so on and so forth. It's, it's pretty much going in, rolling up your sleeves, 
and, and writing the JSON yourself. So, which leads me to the, the, my own personal experiences with these, uh, with these tempos. Something usually fails. So, I mentioned sample data. You can create sample data. But if you do use sample data, every single one that I've run, when you run it, it actually fails creating sample data. Although actually it physically creates the sample data, but the part that says files isn't actually part of the file. The part of the file is the bit that creates all the various JSON artifacts that you really need. So essentially you need to run it once. That will create a, a bunch of sample data with no JSON. And then you need to make sure that, that sample data is available up on Azure where you think you put it. If it's not, then you actually have to physically go in, manually edit the PowerShell scripts, and physically upload the files yourself because the PowerShell scripts don't, you know, I don't think they're quite templated correctly, so that's why the, uh, the, the copy of the data up fails. But then once you write once, if you just go in and you deselect uh, the fact that you don't want to uh, create sample data the next time, the next time you run it, it runs through, and if you choose not to publish to, to base factory, um, then it will go ahead and create all JSON artifacts. And the reason I say don't publish the data factory is because once you run it through the first time and you've created your sample data and had a problem and you've corrected that, if you run it through a second time and do publish the data factory, normally one of those processes will also fail. So then you're left basically going to the portal and finding out what the problem was and essentially creating it. So just taking what you've what's been created as the JSON artifact and publishing it through. And the other small point there is not, nothing really major, but there's no way of actually physically deleting uh, an artifact from a project. You have to exclude it and then go and delete it from disk. It's just a, just a minor little thing, really, but uh, just be wary of that. Deployment this is another one of the things that I fairly recently. You can, um, you can essentially add new config files to your Visual Studio templates or uh, projects, big button. And that allows you to create a bunch of configuration files that are specific to different deployment environments. So for instance, you can create them for you know, your test environments, production environments, and so on and so forth. And when you do do your deployments and publish to, to Azure Data Factory, you get to choose whichever um, particular JSON file you want to, to choose that's got your configuration for that particular environment. Uh, quite useful little thing that just added. So, monitoring. Not surprisingly, uh, with, uh, with all these uh, Azure services, you can drill in and drill through many, many things. Um, since I say their data slices may fail, uh, there could be any reason why they fail. Maybe you know your storage isn't available, or <coughs> or there's a timeout on a service, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, so monitoring is a good way of just drilling into that and trying to figure out what's gone wrong and. If a data, uh, data set has failed or data slice has failed at any time, you can just go in and, and rerun it. So the key point about the rerunning is that obviously I've mentioned about the dependency model uh, between the various uh, dependent data sets. When something fails, Data Factory knows how to deal with that failure. So if you've got something that fails and, for instance, uh, a process a bit further downstream or upstream requires uh, HD Insights to be started up, then the data slices that are dependent on that service will just stay in a pending state and they will not be processed until such time as the, the erroneous data set has been fixed. And likewise, you can always enable diagnostics on all these Azure platform services, so you can do that as well. It's disabled by default, which I was quite surprised by. Um, but uh, you just need a, another storage account and, and, and you're away. And you can have alerts for failed and successful runs. Uh, I'm guessing they'll probably add other alerts in the future, but right now it's just for failed or successful runs. And that's the usual alerts that you have in, in the standard platform. Oh, so that's the interesting part. So, where are we? We are here. So I have already created, but this is essentially going to be uh, a demo or to start with is, uh, is the copy process. So I've created a bunch of orders there on storage currently. So if we go in and look through this, we can see that 
I've got three months of orders, and this is just a fairly simple file. So if I go into Visual Studio, I can go and have a look. Let's quickly have a quick look. Essentially, all this is is an order number, uh, an organisation that's made that order, uh, a specific project, a product that they've bought, uh, the quantity of that product, and the price. So, this is obviously on Azure Block Storage, and what I'll do is I'll uh, have that transferred down to my local uh, SQL Server here. So, my SQL Server, you can see, I currently have no orders. Yes, awesome. So. Prove that it's uh, just prove that it's all working. So we go back up here. We can see if we go to the actual data factory itself. I created one previously. Um, it does take a few minutes to create, so I thought I'd take you that drama. So this is the basic uh, blade for for data factory. We have the ability to auto deploy. There's the diagram. And you can drill into the various things that you've created. And then down here we have the visual alerts and, and data factory metrics. If you don't want to use the Visual Studio template and you just want to have a bit of a play with the data factory straight off, if you click sample pipelines here, this customer profile um, sample, if you click that, then essentially what that will do is that will deploy a completely uh, managed um, instance of the customer profile template which is also the case with the profile template that you see in Visual Studio, but it's a way of doing it within, uh, within the portal itself. But if we were to go ahead and start uh, start creating this now, click Author and Deploy. The first thing you notice is that I don't have anything timing. This is all empty. Because I'm going to need to Push stuff to the uh, to my to my local machine. I'm going to need to use the data gateway. I've already installed the data gateway because uh, again for expediency. First, I've got some more commands. New data gateway. What this will do is this this is essentially creating the the link within data factory that will be so the the data factory endpoint that will link directly back to my data factory on my PC. The key point here is this is this key. This is the unique key that is used to uh, to create the, the the physical link to the data factory here. So if I start this service, I need to change the key because this is a this is a new one. Click OK. Yep, we're done. That takes a little bit of a while to register, which is why I did it first. So I click OK to that. OK to that. And you'll see what it's done is it's created this <coughs> me, data factory object. And at the moment, it's still saying that it needs registration. So all this is currently is this has just created the, the endpoint within the data factory. But now we need to start creating things that uh, that can represent the data itself. Uh, remember, I said that for me, the, the link services are pretty important, uh, the key point. So, if I go to this new data store, and I do, I do notice that there are several ways that these things are mentioned throughout. It's sometimes they're called link services, sometimes they're called they have, they're called data stores here, and compute because obviously link services can represent either of those two things. So, if you go here again, you can see the list of data sources that I can create. So I'm going to create one for Azure Storage. So you can see over here you need to input the connection string. Remember this is just a link to that service. It's not the, the structure of the server of the data itself. So it's just a link to the store. So for expediency I'm going to copy the one I created earlier. So what I'm doing here is creating something. There's the connection string to my uh, 
as your blog stories you saw previously. So currently at the moment you can see down here it says draft. As soon as I click deploy, it does literally deploy at that point. So just things to be wary of um, is that as you're doing these things, if 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 you're deploying things that have actions associated with them like a uh, pipeline, then at the point if, it, if the availability and the um, start and end time of that pipeline are current, then they will start executing straight away. There's no there's no stop and start process here. It's when you deploy is when it starts. So that's that. We'll also add the one for the SQL on premises SQL Server. So if we grab that SQL Server. So because this is on premises, you can see that it's got the gateway name in it. So if we just go back down to our gateway, is it finished? No, it's still going. <coughs> but then beyond that, it's pretty much just a standard data source type uh, connection screen as you'd expect normally. The Username and password here, as I mentioned here, is, is really if you uh, if you're going to use Windows authentication. Uh, one thing to note, of course, is that if you do put your password in here, don't worry, it does get obfuscated once you deploy it. So when you so if somebody else looks at this, it's just uh, it's just written as stars. Again, uh, here's one I created earlier. So, I've now created my two linked services. Link services are no good unless there's, there's data associated to them. So, uh, if we go back down to uh, new data, or go across the new data set, we're going to add blob storage because that's what's, uh, what, what's, uh, what the data, the, the orders, the CSV files are. And I think it does a pretty good job of showing you some uh, a basic template here with some uh, some nice little tooltips as, as we go through. So just just a, an idea of the structure here. So at the top here we have the structure itself. That's the physical structure of your data. And you can see it's a, it's a name and a specific type of that. You can then put in where the where the files or your data comes from. If we just look across here. You'll see that there are these uh, these placeholders, year, month, and day. And you can see that here it says partition by year, month, and day. And this is using that uh, system variable that I was talking about. So start, slice, slice, start, slice, start. Essentially, what this is going to allow you to do is create or read in data from a very, very specified start uh, folder structure based on the slice start date. So for instance, if in my particular case, I've got uh, 2015 and and uh, a month, so so not surprisingly, obviously mine contains, contains that, so if I get rid of that, and just get to the one I created earlier. So in here you, you see that orders uh, year and month, and I get the start, uh, the date for the, the year and the month for that uh, folder structure from the slice start. Because this is the, the, the initial data set, it's not created by data factory, so I have to set external equals true, and I found that this is available once a month. So essentially what this means is that every single month at the beginning of that month, for the active period of the, of the pipeline, it will look in a folder based on the year and month from that start time and, and bring in the data. At the top here I've got uh, the structure of the file. We saw it before, it's an order number and organization. The nice thing about this is that we also get full Um, IntelliSense, oh, I can get it something. Oops. 
So you get, you get pretty good intelligence out of this thing and, uh, and helps you along. So, so it's, it's quite a good way of just making sure that you've got the, the data right first time. So let me just deploy that as well. The next one I need to walk through is or bring in is the one for the SQL Server. So again, new data set. This is going to be a SQL Server table. So I'm just going to copy this directly into a SQL Server table. I'll just grab that straight away. Again, we reflect the structure. Um, SQL Server table, and we have to give it the table name that it's coming into. Uh, for the for the for the ease of this particular demo, both of these are available just once a month. Um, obviously, if this was another input data set and the frequency was different to the other file, then when I come to create the activities and the structure uh, of the pipeline, I'd have to create that dependency between the two. Let me just deploy that. I'm just going to check my gateway. So you see now it's added that uh, that key. I need to check, uh, add the certificate. Remember, I've actually just installed very, very secure. So I'll just choose the current one that I already have. And leave that to its uh, own devices. So I've now got my link services. I've now got my data set. The one thing I need next is the pipeline, which will dictate the activities that occur to uh, on these, on these specific data sets. Now, in this particular case, it's a very simple one. It's just a, a single copy. So if I add oops, a new pipeline, and I'll, again, for sake of expediency, the time is getting on. So you'll see here that a list of activities, in this particular case just the one, it's a copy, it's going from source, blog source to a SQL sync, uh, I then have to give it the data sets that are the inputs and the outputs, so those, those match over here. <coughs> I won't talk too much about this sort of stuff, it's got this particular um, activity, remember this can have multiple activities, this particular activity is scheduled to run once a month, a little bit of description. I've got a start and then time for my particular pipeline. So remember, there's three things. You've got the availability of the data sets. You've got the scheduler, which dictates how often the activity runs within a pipeline. And then you've got how uh, the active period of that particular pipeline. So you can see that this runs from the 1st of the 9th, 2015, until the 31st of the 12th, 2016. And if you remember the structure of the folder that I had, I had 2015, month 9, 10, and then 11. So because this is in the past, as soon as I click this deploy, it will go ahead and it will start processing the data. So before I do that, I just want to make sure that the okay, so that's still loading. I'll just that finished for two seconds. So in the meantime, whilst that's finishing, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just talk through the other solution very quickly. So if we go to the customer profile solution. So this is the same one that you can create directly in the portal. This is, this is once it's been created, and you can see that uh, it creates a bunch of linked services, pipelines, and again, this, this distance that you get across the terms. Um, here, they're called tables. Everywhere else, they're called data sets. But in essence, what this has got, this has got a bunch of pipelines, um, that transform and copy data across. So if we just have a quick look at a couple of those. Here's a particular pipeline which joins some information. So this runs a particular um, script. And then this egress that are copy. So if we look at the activities, we've got the name is join. You just look down here, what is it? It's a HD Insights Hive query. So that's the transform. There's a bunch of inputs and outputs. And if we look at the transform itself, again, this is all really the same. It all works very similar way. So it all, it all works by, uh, by replacements, essentially. So you can see there, events, inputs. If we go back here, you can see events, inputs, and so on. 
Uh, likewise with uh, the one of the other pipelines, where uh, this is oh, so this one runs runs a pig query, uh, pig script, pig one. So this uh, this does much the same thing. It's got the defines, and those are, are reflected within the, the the pig script itself. And then there's a bunch of other information in here in terms of link services and so on. So I forget to get to the inside one again. Uh, we can see that this will go ahead and create an HD insight on demand. Sorry, that's a storage. Think about this one. Uh, this will create a, an on demand HD insight cluster. It's got a five minute uh, idle time at the end, after which it will shut down. Uh, <coughs> cluster size is one. So you can see how you can build these things up, and then, uh, then it's just a fairly simple case to, to deploy them. From a config perspective, I've not completed this fully, but you can see here this uh, and the customer profiling as your SQL link service. If you look at that particular one here, we have a connection string. So within that config, you can put in the particular connection string that's valid for that particular deployment environment, and obviously you can build these environments up to be uh, how you see fit. So when you do the deployment process itself, Publish. So no matter how many times you uh, say say password, it doesn't. So all this is doing is going away and, and basically looking at my subscription just to, just to bring back the, the current data factory that I've already got set up. You see there's resource initialization in progress. Let's check on the state of the gateway, so that's all finished. That's good. You can see it's getting data factory in the background. So I think it's existing. That's a really good job there, isn't it? I'll come back to that. So, going back to the copy demo. So this has now all been deployed, except for this, this pipeline here. So currently nothing has been run. And remember, because this is set in asked, as soon as I click this deploy, it will start executing the pipeline. So, deploy, and off it goes. So we go back to the main blade and we just look at this link services. We can see here that it's saying that I've got my data gateway, it's online, I've got my SQL link service, that's also online. So obviously they're, they're 30 key points if you're, if you're moving data to and from uh, your on-premises machine. <clears throat> if we now go to, to data sets and look at the specific data sets that are relevant to our particular instance here, we see a bunch of pending validation here. Yeah. Just, just expand that out. We can see we've got three that are ready. So these are upstream data slices. So the, these are the initial data sets. So remember I said that in the past for ninth. So you can see here that three data sets uh, uh, September, October, and November are ready. All the rest of the same pending validation. That's because they haven't been produced yet. Okay, so so it's building that dependency. We close that and look at the orders table. So at the moment it's saying that this particular one is in progress. Basically the way that the backfill works is it does it in parallel. So you don't know what order the data will necessarily come through in. So it's saying this one is in progress and the others are all pending execution. Look at that in progress one. It's saying upstream slices that are not ready, there aren't any. So essentially it's saying it's got all the data it needs and it can go ahead and start processing. So if we were to then look at our database, we should hopefully start seeing some data coming through, which we are. 
for how it works. And of course, we can come down here. I'll just quickly show you the, the information that you can see here. So the successful runs that's something coming through. Uh, we can go into the alerts, and this is pretty much the standard alert process that you have in, in all other areas of, of Azure. And I can choose specifically only right now failed or successful runs. Yeah. If we come back here now, we should see that all that data is there. And of course, the nice thing about the data being here is I can then spark up a very, very basic Very, very basic, simple Power BI dashboard, and uh, you get all the usual sort of stuff that you, that you normally get. So you can you imagine how easy and powerful, or how easy that was, and how powerful it can be, depending on the data that you're bringing in. So if we go back to the, uh, the other demo here, so this has already been deployed to uh, to Zero, because it does take quite some time to, to go and run through. So let me just quickly. Look into this as well. Know that we're running fairly short on time, actually. So, and again, I can link through all of these and, and and look. Obviously, these aren't online or offline because they're as required. Pipelines here. I can look into these pipelines. Um, the analyzed marketing pipeline, for instance, here. So I can look at that, and I can look at the source. And if I look at the source, it just takes me straight to the uh, design surface. So again, it's got all the usual uh, link trees on all the blades. Um, if we actually go to um, sorry, activity, it's down here as well. So let's look at that activity. That's a that's a hive activity. So I can look at the activity script in here as well. I can't change the scripts. It's the wrong thing I can't do. But I can at least view the scripts. And then the other the other drill through I'll do right now is you can see here that we've got one error. So if I go into the data sets, I can see that this particular data set has an error. And it's because the process timed out. Okay, so if I look, click through on that, I can see that it timed out for some reason. After 60 minutes, it hadn't worked. If I wanted to, I could rerun that slice. And all dependent data slices that are downstream from this would then execute as required. Uh, another way of looking through this is if we go into the diagrams, I'm not showing the diagram yet, uh, because this one's a bit more interesting than the others. <coughs> so we can see here that we've got input, a pipeline with some activity, some more input. We've got something that's gone wrong. If you look at the actual pipeline that's downstream of that, if you right click this, you can open the pipeline. I just open the design surface a bit more. We can see that there's a bunch of other stuff down here. If we were to go to the marketing campaign here, you see the same pending execution. It's pending execution because there is an upstream slice that's not ready. So it's worked out all that data lineage and dependency for us, uh, and it maintains all that. Do all that for us as well. So we're going to close that back out. If we actually have a look at the data lineage, we can see, go back to the factory for this, it's a bit more visual. If we click a particular data set, if I turn lineage on, I can see where this, this, this little switch is. I can see this data sets that are dependent on this specific data set. So if I click through this, I can see where the things are linked together, quite a good visual representation, and allows you to drill into the specific data sets that you are particularly interested in. Um, I won't actually run that particular data set, um, because it does take some time, because it'll have to re-spark up a, an instance of, of, of HD Insight. <coughs> the only other thing I thought I'd show very quickly is Visual Studio, I can just start the instance here. I'll just quickly wander through and show you the templates. So 
So these are the two standard um, samples. So customer profiling is the same as the one that's available in the, in the portal, and customer churn is the one that runs uh, machine learning. So it's completely forgotten again. A machine learning um, endpoint. And then there's some fairly standard copy processes and the data processing templates at the bottom for hide and pick. This is the include sample data that I was talking about. So if we were to just choose one of these very, very quickly. In fact, we're, we're running a short time, so I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll leave it there. But if you choose this, you can then tell it which bits you want to create. Uh, and this is the process by which I was mentioning about the fact that sometimes it uh, works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I've never actually known it to work directly off. But it does create this sample data for you. So when you run it first, it won't create the artifacts, but it will create sample data. Yeah, that's uh, obviously first thing in the morning. It's just not great. So the, um, the various inputs and, and the PowerShell scripts to, to physically upload the data to the uh, to the portal. That's the demos. Um, hopefully they were useful. Let me get back to the slide deck. Uh, that's a kookaburra, otherwise known as laughing kookaburra. Um, so just very quickly, we'll just go through some, uh, we've got about three more slides left. Um, the way the pricing works with Data Factory is you've got low frequency, which is less than once per, running once per day, and high frequency. So just bear that in mind when you're creating a Data Factory that it does have an impact on the price. Um, data movement is, is just a fairly standard flat fee. And the other thing to consider is that uh, the pipeline, if it's an active, you still get charged, but albeit not very much, but you do still get charged for it. So very, very quickly, a summary of that, of uh, what I've been going through. So what is Data Factory? It's great for dealing with big data. It's used in the same terms as, as Cortana Analytics Suite, so information management. Um, it's great if your source or you've got either a source or a destination that's in the cloud. Um, usual platform as a service arguments around environmental cost and, and, and Administration cost. Um, oh, I'm mentioning it twice. So uh, there's only on one side. But the key point there is that it can be used very easily in console with other types of data um, management tools, such as SQL Server integration services, which I mentioned uh, last week. Final slide, really. A uh, few pieces of information there. I know this slide deck is put up, but uh, the first one is the documentation portal. That's really very good. Uh, the learning map, I think, is probably one of the better learning maps of all the various uh, geo services. So do definitely go there and start digging into it. Uh, and there is an ever-increasing ever list of samples on GitHub. So I think that's my last slide. Yes, so, uh, Mike, I think I'll pass back to you now. Thank you, mate. Um, so we've just got a couple of questions came in, but if, if anybody else has any questions, they'd like to put them 